In this SY4 revision screencast, I'm going to try and demystify the 30 mark question from the research method section of the exam. So hopefully you'll be familiar now with the layout of the research method section of SY4. So we've got the item, we've got the 10 mark question, and then we've got the focus of this screencast, which is this longer 30 mark question. And when you're reading through the 30 mark question, there are certain bits of information that you need to scan the question for. So firstly, you need to know what type of data you need to collect. And in this case, we can see that it clearly says that we've got to collect qualitative data. So the question will either say that you've got to collect quantitative data, or as we can see in this example, it will be qualitative data, it will be one or the other. The second thing that you need to scan the question for uh, is the purpose of the research. So in this case we can see that the purpose of the research is to look at attitudes to parenting. So that's the topic of the research. And then finally the other thing that you need to scan the question for is the target population. In other words the group that you're doing the research on. So in this case it's a sample of parents. And remember that the wording of the rest of the question is standardised, it won't change. So it always starts with the instruction, as an A-level sociology student you've been asked to design a research project and then these bullet points are always worded in exactly the same way. Now in order to answer this question fully you need to think about your research design as consisting of these seven different parts. You need to say what you're going to do, you need to say why, that's the justification, and your justification wherever possible should be linked to the methodological issues known as Grover. Grover, remember, stands for generalizability, representativeness, objectivity, validity, ethics and reliability. So wherever possible uh, your justification needs to link to one of those issues. Also you need to talk about the problems. Now you haven't got the time to talk about the problems of every part of your research design but you do need to discuss uh, in full the problems with the research method that you are going to use and also the problems with the sampling technique that you're going to use. And once again, wherever possible, the problems that you identify need to be linked to some aspect of Grover. And in the rest of the screencast, I'm going to talk through uh, each of these different sections of your research design. So when sociologists are doing research, they always need to define, and in the case of quantitative research, measure the key concepts, the key ideas that they're using in their research. And this process of defining our key terms, and in the case of quantitative research, working out how we're going to measure them, is known as operationalizing our key terms. And this is the first thing that you need to discuss uh, for the 30 part question. So, for example, let's imagine that we wanted to do research quantitative research measuring the extent of poverty. The first thing that we would need to have a think about is how we can define poverty. We would need to establish a clear definition of this particular uh, theoretical idea. Then if we're doing quantitative research we then need to work out what indicators we would use that would enable us to directly measure this concept of poverty. So for example, I might look at the indicator of income, that might be uh, a useful way of measuring poverty, and I could specify that for the purpose of my research, anybody with an annual income of less than £10,000 a, a year uh, is living in poverty. So an indicator is something that allows me to directly measure uh, a key concept, uh, in this case, uh, income 
is an indicator that enables me to directly measure the concept of poverty. I'll give you a couple of other examples. If I wanted to measure the concept of educational achievement, then obviously a key indicator of educational achievement, something that I could use to directly measure that particular concept, would be looking at examination results. If I was interested in the concept of social class, one way in which I could directly measure that concept would be to look at the jobs that people do. Now one of the most common types of 30 mark questions would be a question where you're asked to look at people's social attitudes towards a particular topic. And in the case of quantitative research, where you're trying to measure people's attitudes, the way in which you could operationalise that would be to use questions that are scaled. So here we can see an example of a question about people's attitudes towards one particular part of the NHS, accident and emergency departments, and these are the scales that people are asked to use when they answer this particular question. And this five-part scale from very satisfied to very dissatisfied is known as a Likert scale. So as we've just seen, if you're doing quantitative research, this process of operationalising your key terms either involves you coming up with indicators that enable you to directly uh, measure a particular concept, or they involve the use of scaled questions if you're exploring people's social attitudes. If, on the other hand, you're doing qualitative research, then deliberately you're going to be much vaguer about your key concepts when you start your research. The whole idea of doing qualitative research is to start uh, with an open mind, to have very broad outlines of concepts, which you then revise and narrow and make more precise as you actually collect data. Remember, the whole idea of qualitative research is usually to explore the world from the point of uh, view of your subjects. And this is the reason why you want to start with very vague de definitions of concepts that you then refine once you've got a better understanding of the perspectives of the people that you're doing the research on. So having operationalised your key terms, the second part of your research design needs to be about the method that you're going to use. And you only need to use one particular method. You haven't got the time to talk about uh, a mixed method approach of triangulation. And you need to think about the type of data that you've got to collect. If it's quantitative data, then my suggestion for your method would either be questionnaires or structured interviews. If it's qualitative data, then my suggestion would be to consider either unstructured interviews or participant observation. And remember, for this part of your answer, you've got to say why you've chosen a particular method, link that to Grover, but you also need to discuss the potential problems with your research method and the impact that those problems would have on some aspect of Grover. Now the key to doing this well in the exam is to relate your justification of the method that you've chosen as closely as you possibly can uh, to the particular topic and research population that they've given you uh, in the question. And if we have a look at Amy's answer, we can see a really good example uh, of this. So if you just hit the pause button and have a read through this particular paragraph. And what's really good about this paragraph is it's displaying good knowledge of unstructured interviews, but it's really relating that knowledge closely to the design brief. So for example, um, we've got here this section that this method also allows me to be flexible with what questions to ask, so that's a key advantage of using unstructured interviews, their flexibility. And then that's really related to the actual topic in the question. So depending on their answers or even the family type that they're a part of, 
So there are lots of different types of families, single parent, same sex, uh, reconstituted, which means a step family. So I really like this. This is about looking at the strength of unstructured interviews, its flexibility, but really relating it closely to the actual topic. And the most common criticism made in the examiner's reports of students uh, doing the 30 mark question is that they don't relate their knowledge of methods to the specific topic and research population. In other words, they just rehearse very generic research designs that they've memorised before they get into the exam. The key to getting the best mark possible is to really relate your knowledge of methods closely to the specific design brief that they give you. The third thing that you must remember to discuss in the exam are the ethical considerations that underpin your research design. So as we can see from the spec, there are a range of ethical issues that you might want to discuss. You won't have the time to look at all of these issues, but you certainly want to pick one or two of these issues and discuss them uh, in the light of your uh, research design. The other thing that you could mention briefly is the importance of reading and following the Statement of Ethical Practice from the British Sociological Association, the BSA, which is the professional body that represents academic sociologists within the UK. The fourth thing that you need to discuss is your sample technique. This needs to be justified, but this is also another section of your research design where you need to look at the problems as well and the impact of those problems, particularly on things like representativeness and generalizability. So one of the things that you need to work out with your research design is who your respondents are going to be. And although it would be really good to select and study everybody in your target population, that's not usually going to be possible. You're not going to have the time or the resources to do that. And this is why you will have to talk about obtaining a sample. So a sample is a relatively small proportion of the people who belong to the overall target population. And usually a key consideration here is this issue of representativeness. And representativeness uh, is about whether or not the characteristics of your smaller group, the sample, accurately reflect those of the target population. So, for example, if there are 60% of people in your target population who are women, you would expect your sample to consist of 60% women as well in order to accurately reflect the characteristics of the target population. And if the sample group is representative, then anything discovered about this smaller group can then uh, be applied to the bigger target population. And that's what we mean by the issue of generalizability. Now, examiners are often very critical of students' lack of knowledge of sampling techniques. So this is another area that is consistently highlighted as a weakness in student responses. So make sure that you thoroughly revised uh, the two screencasts on sampling techniques. Now, usually the best way of obtaining a representative sample is to use some form of random sampling. But in order to do random sampling, you must have access to a sample frame. A sample frame is a list of everybody uh, in your target population. And with random sampling, you assign everybody on that list a number and then you randomly generate uh, a series of numbers. And what we can see on this slide are some examples of sample frames that you might use uh, depending on the topic and the target population. So we've got things like the raw mail address list. If we want a random selection of addresses in your local area, we've got the electoral register. If you're doing research on children or inside school, we've got registers, we've got professional membership lists, and we've got company payrolls. These are all examples of things that we might use as sample frames depending on the research. But of course depending on the nature of the research using a sample frame 
might not always be possible. So as we can see on this slide, there are some fairly obvious reasons as to why it might not be possible uh, to gain access to a list of everybody in your target population. And where you can't use a sample frame, you're going to have to use some form of non-random sampling. You're going to have to consider the use of things like opportunity sampling and quota sampling or snowball sampling or volunteer sampling as an alternative to using a random technique. The fifth thing to briefly discuss in your research design is the importance of doing a pilot study. And a pilot study is a mini version of the full scale study that you're going to do. So the purpose of this is obviously to test and tweak the research instruments that you're going to be using during your research. So for example, if you're doing questionnaires or interviews, a pilot study might involve you uh, trialling questions to eliminate possible sources of bias, looking at things like the use of leading questions, checking that people understand your questions, and maybe collecting some preliminary data that might allow you to ask questions on other topics that you've not considered. The sixth thing to discuss, but very briefly, is how you're actually going to do the research the practicalities of your research. So if you're doing questionnaires, how are they going to be distributed? If you're doing interviews, where are those interviews going to take place? How are they going to be recorded? And so on. And then the final section of your answer, you need a brief section on the analysis and interpretation of your results. So data can never speak for itself. The information that you collect using your research method always has to be analysed and interpreted. And the analysis of your data um, is about categorising your data, bringing together your information, putting it into what you think are appropriate groups and categories. And this is a process that is known as coding your data. An interpretation uh, involves the researcher asking what the data and the overall research means. What is the significance of the data uh, that they've collected? Remember that there are lots of uh, resources to help you on iLearn for this section of the exam, including all the past exam papers and also lots of model uh, answers to 30 mark questions so that you can really see what's involved uh, in answering this section of the exam.